I think it's fair to say that um, when I was appointed, I regarded it as possibly a kind of honorary role to see me into the sunset of my professional life, but it has been anything but that, and virtually there is no day when I'm not in some way involved in the affairs of the Ethics Board. And it has been, as you say, very challenging. I mean, a lot, of course, of what we do is necessarily private, uh, but at least two matters have um, featured in the public's attention. The first, of course, was the what we call the Shobakova case, in which uh, the former so the son of the former president of the IF, I mean, Diak, and high-ranking Russian athletic officials were allegedly involved and we found were actually involved in a conspiracy to extort money from a well-known female marathon senior in order to conceal her doping violations and enable her to continue to make a great deal of money on the international marathon circuit. And the second, uh, we've suspended high-ranking Kenyan officials who are alleged to be guilty of not dissimilar activities as well as other corrupt practices. I should emphasize as, that, as far as that's concerned, that's merely a interim suspension, no final adjudication has been reached. But there's a whole series of other matters that are continuing to be investigated. Well, one of the things, we inherited uh, everything. We inherited the membership, we inherited rules that were drafted by other persons, um, obviously in good faith but without any kind of experience. And I suppose the two most uh, major things that have occurred, first of all, as a result of our early experience uh, in our second annual meeting which took place in the Beijing World Championships in 2015, we came up with a series of proposals to amend and improve the procedures under which we operated, all of which, all of which were promptly agreed by the IAF Council. So that was the first uh, major achievement, and the second of which was because of the workload and because we'd inherited a board without any women, uh, we um, had two further women appointed of the very highest quality, one um, a South African con judge of the Constitutional Court and the other a senior uh, lawyer uh, and involved in sports administration in Singapore, so we both had gender and geographic breadth <laughs> to add to the members who are now nine. It obviously was frustrating because it did enable journalists uh, in utter good faith to say, well, they don't appear to be doing anything at all, what's the purpose of them? Whereas, in fact, uh, we not only did we start our investigation both before WADA and indeed before the German television program, which um, broadcast these issues to a wider world, but we were very carefully and conscientiously with an aid of a very senior former appellate judge in this country carrying out the investigation and then we had a full hearing uh, observing all the rules of natural justice and due process and what have you and came to the conclusion which we reached. And of course uh, it's fair to say um, that the report was, re the award was received very well uh, by the majority, if not everyone in the press, some thought we should have been even tougher than we were, though how much tougher one could be of a life ban, not easy to see. But that being said, I know, and now I hope our relationship is, is, is a somewhat better one. Well, they're obviously very considerable challenges. Uh, I think I ought to uh, make clear that although do the doping uh, code is part of the overall ethics code. It's the one subject that we don't ourselves um, investigate. I mean, that's really a matter for specialists. We only became involved, for example, in both the Russian and the Kenyan matter because there was there, in one case, proven, and in the other case, allegations of official involvement in concealment and so on and so forth. So that although I'm not the person who's best able to speak for the IAF, I mean, the very fact that they put, um, well, first of all, Russia, of course, is notorious, but other countries as well on the kind of warned list does show that they are taking it very seriously. Well, the precedent, which I think is the precedent that one wants to follow, is what the IOC did. Uh, there was this extraordinary scandal in relation to the Salt Lake City Olympics in 2002, in which it was proven that various council members who had a vote in allocating uh, to the particular city the Winter Olympics had received uh, bribes, in one case, the bribe involved plastic surgery. Um, as a result of that, Dick Pound, then the 
vice president of the IOC, subsequently chairman of WADA and still a very, very influential figure in world sport, was given the task of providing a reform program. And so by the time, for example, it came to the London Olympics when I was ethics commissioner for our bid, there was a very, very complicated set of rules to ensure that people didn't step over the line. Of course, people can step over the line um, knowing that it's a line, but as it were going below the surface. And that, I think, depends just in trying to improve the general culture. And of course, I think to complement that, to make certain that if uh, allegations of impropriety are made and can be substantiated, then s disciplinary sanctions will follow. Um, there's another point that I, perhaps I would like to make on behalf not just of my board but of any other ethics commission which we've learnt, um, that, well we've learnt, we always knew but it's been important to sharp focus. We simply do not have the powers that public authorities have. We cannot search, we cannot seize, we cannot survey, we cannot subpoena witnesses, we cannot access bank accounts and things like that. And we can't even behave like journalists have behaved, that's to say involving themselves in entrapment, which is a perfectly legitimate way of proceeding, but not one that's open to a board that's called an ethics board. So we very much have to rely upon cooperation and importantly, of course, upon whistleblowers. I mean, this is really where I think the development of the law, developing processes to protect anonymity, even perhaps in future, like they have in, you know, the FBI, giving people safe houses and new identities and so on. I mean, it seems a sort of macabre world, but um, that's the direction in which I fear we may have to go if we're able to root out a culture of this kind. I mean, don't forget, we were the first uh, ethics board the IF have ever had. Um, and indeed, um, whatever one may or may not say about the former President Diak, he at least <laughs> deserved credit for having established this particular board. Um, how we can avoid um, the mistakes of, of the past that have infected other boards, I think uh, it's useful just to focus on the word independent, because if it's entirely true, that we are not independent in the sense that we are a wholly external body and we continue of course to be funded by the IAF because there's no alternative source of funds and we continue to be appointed by the IAF. But what I have said uh, internally, and I'm entirely free to repeat it to you, we're independent in this sense that when if the actions we take we do not receive guidance, still less dictation from the IAF or indeed any other uh, body at all. That's point one. And point two, however high up the hierarchy the allegations may relate to, we will fearlessly investigate them. That's as far, but I think sufficient for our independence. There's no doubt at all that additional fun funding would assist us, not just in terms of money, but actually in terms of um, support staff and matters of that kind. I think it's fair to say that President Coe and the Council, who are engaged uh, in a massive programme of reform, are very alert to the fact that uh, if you're going to have an ethics board, as, as if you're going to have an anti-doping organisation, you've got to fund it properly, otherwise there's no point. I don't think I can say more than that. I mean, it's ongoing work and the results will no doubt become public uh, in the uh, not too distant future. I think some of the reforms the, for example, FIFA's uh, reforms. Now just ignore what may or may not have happened in the past. One of the things that has been done is to set a term limit uh, for the president. Um, another that has been done is to divorce the policy-making entity of FIFA from the operational entity. Now the first of these does uh, result in, uh, well, it diminishes the opportunity in any organisation for breeding, as it were, well not necessarily a culture of corruption, but just it's, you know, it's all the king's men, it's all the people around you. You grant them favours and they can be in perfectly legitimate favours, but then, you, you're, you know, you could be there forever. Um, 
There are organisations, I needn't mention them, but I've come across them in my functions as an arbitrator in CAS, where the persons have been in charge for you know, more than decades, and, and, and this is just not healthy. It's not healthy in politics. See Mrs Thatcher, see Tony Blair, yeah, see actually the wisdom perhaps of the Americans in their constitution allowing a presidency for only two terms. And I think this is the way it's going. FINA, the swimming international organization, very, very interesting. Last year, they actually went in the opposite direction. and They started saying there should be no time limits or age limits for council members. This year before Rio, on the agenda, they've gone into reverse. They've recognised that actually what they were doing was counter potentially ethical. Uh, and so I think there is, a, uh, there is a wind of change that's sweeping through sports governance. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you, when they say money is the root of all evil, I don't know if that comes from the Bible or whatever it does, but wh whatever it does, I mean, it's obviously highly influential. I mean, if there were no money involved in being a, a city that hosts a major world championships or prize money for winning a competition and so on, no one would really mind very much. But it's, it's really someone, a rather astute journalist, I thought, divided sports governance eras into two distinct sections before television and after television. He said before television, the people who governed sport tended to be sort of amiable amateurs and no one really bothered very much about what they were doing. Um, they were given ruder names, I think, uh, by, for example, Will Carling, which won't repeat in the public programme. But as after television, then of course, it's become a really major industry. Sport is, I think, the 20th largest industry in the world. And it's always been my impression, ever since I started in sports law, that actually the sport has outgrown its governance. It doesn't have, with a few exceptions, the kind of persons with you know, financial, political, social skills, really, to administer a major organisation. But again, I mean, that is, that's now being changed. I think that's been appreciated as being a failing. Well, I think one of the points that Craig was making was whether or not uh, he could obtain funding for WADA um, in, uh, from different sources. I think Dick Pound recently said, look now at Ms. Sharapova, she earns more in a week than our funding for a year. I mean, it gives you some idea of sort of dimensions of the difference between the elite sportsmen and the, um, the bodies involved in, in policing the sport. But I think the second point, the point perhaps more particular to the one you make, is, is, is very astute. I mean, oh, there are, it seems to be two groups who can influence the future of sport. One, of course, are sponsors, because sponsors, as you say, in various sports, have started to pull out of sponsoring um, the sports that they perceive are ill-governed and even corruptly governed. They could, of course, do more. I mean, there are well-known companies who continue, for example, to sponsor athletes who have a doping track record, if I can put it that way, you'd feel happier perhaps if they exercised, as it were, a, a blanket ban on, on uh, associating themselves with athletes of that kind. Mm -hmm. But the other group, and I think it's really the most potentially influential group, are just the spectators. I think there will or may come a time in which people will say, we simply are not interested in looking at sport which is rigged, either because people are involved in match fixing or because they're all doped up to the eyebrows or because, in fact, all we can see is a lot of fat cats swanning around in first-class aeroplanes and luxury hotels, taking money out of the sport that ought to go to the grassroots. Actually, Gianni Anfantino, the new president of FIFA, made a rather eloquent d d um, comment on as it were, the money being diverted in the wrong directions at, at just at the time uh, when FIFA itself was now claiming back, uh, as it were, restitution from some of the people who've already been indicted in the American courts and the like. But it's true. And, and I mean, that's the challenge. Um, those 
of us who are involved to a greater or lesser extent in trying to clean the sport, recognise they're doing the interests of the spectators, but what we'd like to have, as it were, the spectators who are, the, I mean, you know, part of the sport themselves, the most important element in the whole of the activity to applaud and assist. It's, it's obviously important that those are the kind of considerations, human rights considerations, environmental considerations and the others that are taken into account in the future. And again, as one's seen this actually in ordinary corporate governance, I mean, it used to be, well, 20 years ago, what were the uh, obligations of the directors? They were oblig obligations to maximize the uh, money that was paid to shareholders, but now there are statutory obligations to take account of the interests of the workforce, the interests of the environment and matters of that kind. It's just a, a spreading out of the considerations that in a modern society we ought to take into account. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredibly difficult issue um, and I can I've got to be very careful about what I say because I've been adv on advising both the IOC initially and the IF about these issues. And as you say, there is a tension here. I mean, the hyperandrogenism uh, regulations were those that came out um, of the recommendations of a body which involved a whole range of persons from the so-called intersex community, um, the, the ordinary, I'll call ordinary athletes, I mean, all athletes who reflected a binary division of the sexes, ethicists, medical people, lawyers, myself, and so on and so forth. And they came up with this um, uh, hyperandrogenism levels that they thought was the fairest balance they could achieve. Now, the CAS panel took a different view, although they suspended the operation. They thought, just bring more evidence, and that's the exercise uh, which is now being carried out. Um, Ms. Semenya's case is very interesting because at the moment the regulations don't exist and therefore to the extent, and I, I don't know about the detail of her case, but to the extent, for example, that previously she was taking some kind of therapy to reduce her levels below something, she's no longer obliged to do so. No, um, other persons may say, well, yeah, how is this fair on, on other athletes? I mean, interestingly, it wasn't to do with her, it was to do with the case itself. I noticed that a lot of female journalists, without any particular athlete in sports, immediate reaction, well, this just isn't fair. I mean, this is someone, <laughs> it's not that she's not, or they are not women. The question is something different. Should they be able to compete as women in a sporting contest which got a binary divide. So you're not, as it were, casting doubt on their femininity, you're simply setting some kind of, of, of levels in order to have uh, an equal a level playing field. But what the solution will be, I, I'm not in a position to say. I have never um, participated in a case involving a Paralympic. I find the divisions and so on, they must be incredibly complicated and difficult to assess. Interestingly, I don't think anyone has ever tried to challenge, say, I should be, you know, a T35 as opposed to a something 40 or other. And, uh, of course, the Paralympic Games, one of the great successes of London 2012. I mean, you know, who can possibly tell? Um, it, it, it is. I, of course, these things do come up in a slightly arbitrary way. I mean, because you can never, I mean, things after all, <laughs> just take athletics under present year, I think one's safety say things were obviously going on then that no one knew about other than the very small cohort of people. So there may be things going on in other international sports that no one knows about. Um, I suspect that the doping issue uh, is still a very important one. I mean, I'd always, for example, I mean, most of us who follow, for example, track and field always assume, well, the whole point about the Kenyans, they're natural athletes, they've got the altitude advantage and so on. It's actually slightly dispiriting to discover 
that there are, I mean, and you know, to be fair to the Kenyan authorities, they have um, in fact uh, inculpated and found people guilty of doping violations. Ditto in Ethiopia, where we had the same view as all you know, the natural, really gifted runner. So it does appear to be worldwide. On the other hand, you have to look at this. I mean, the, the, the more people are detected and punished, in a sense, the better the system's operating. But how many people are still under the radar? Who knows? This is not a matter for my board, it's a matter of the IAF, and I don't think I ought to comment one way or another. I mean, it would be, in one sense, it would be obvious what would happen if they were disqualified. It would obviously cause an awful lot of anxiety, whether it's necessary to do so in light of what's transpired since the Pound report came out and since the IAF set up this very high-powered inquiry into what is going on. Well, let's just wait and see.